We're continuing in our worship now through the declared Word of God. We've worshiped through song, prayer, uh, reading of the Word, and now testimony. Uh, What beautiful testimonies. And now we want to worship through the preaching of God's Word, and we're going to do that in 1 Peter if you'll turn to chapter 1. If you're visiting, we're currently studying together as a church this epistle. And so we have spent uh, five weeks on Peter's introduction. It was just beautiful in verses 1 through 2. And so we've examined deep and beautiful truths that Peter laid out for us in the Trinity. And he just really the main point, you are chosen aliens. You might be rejected by the world, but God has chosen you and you're separate as you live in this world because your true home and true citizenship is in heaven. And what's really important when studying then through a letter like this is that we don't lose the forest for the trees. And we have just looked at the forest in verses one through two of all of what Peter wants us to get. And now Peter is going to begin looking at the trees. And so I want to remind you again that this letter is being written to a region where suffering is going on, modern day Turkey. And it's about the climax and the Neronian persecution that will be brutal and fierce upon this group. Peter says in chapter 4, don't be surprised at the fiery ordeal among you. This letter is being written to strengthen the church in the midst of persecution and great suffering. And we'll see that they're going to be put in the furnace in verses 6 through 9. And so what we are trying then to get our arms around is how do I go into the furnace of persecution and suffering and not come out as a burnt cinder, but rather come out as refined gold, reflecting the goldsmith who is our God. So there's two ways we we can come out. And Peter's teaching us how do we come out refined gold. Since being a pastor, I've watched people go into all kinds of multicolored, variegated trials, which is in the book of James from the testimony that we heard of that sweet girl reading in James and Peter. I've observed these two outcomes then as I've seen some who come out burnt to a crisp. They come out of this furnace bitter, um, cynical, sour, negative. It really becomes your identity the rest of your life, this trial. But I've watched others who come out as refined gold, and they come out softer and more tender and humble and more ready to serve the Lord Jesus Christ. And so my passion is, Lord, how can we as a church come out as refined gold? That's what I'm preaching for. That's what I'm praying for. I want us to be a group of refined gold. If we were living in Peter's day when he wrote this to us, how would we do in that kind of a furnace? How would we do if if Nero came upon us and started crucifying Christians and killing them and all the martyrdom and all that went on during that season? How how would we do in that kind of a furnace? Well, this week, uh, it's not persecution or, or fiery furnace what I've observed, but I've just in a week, the things I've watched the saints endure, we have this a sweet couple, who, two sisters who've begun coming to our church, and then their little nephew was killed in that Orlando shooting this week, and, and talking on the phone, it was just, I'm steadfast in Christ. You know, my heart is, is for them. There's some unbelievers in the immediate family, and there's just a, a steadfastness. I went uh, to a dear, sweet friend who was buried this week. He played for the Denver Broncos. And his wife said, you know, he, anyone he met within 30 seconds, he preached Jesus Christ to them. And now he's in the presence of Jesus Christ. And as we sat at the graveside, she took every mourner, brought her into her bosom and comforted them and encouraged them, took my wife and said, how's your sister doing? She's just this radiant, glorious, vibrant Christian who believes the gospel and just put it on display in every way. How do we do this? Well, Peter's going to answer that for us this morning. If I had to boil it down, I'm going to tell you this, it would be our hope. Where is your hope placed? In 1 Peter 1, 3, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his great mercy has caused us to be born again to a living hope. And so before the new birth, we had no biblical hope. We don't have the true hope as unbelievers. We had hope, yes, we put it in all kinds of things. Every one of us had a hope in something that we were looking for in this world that we wanted that would make us happy. 
I watched a graduation yesterday, and they were just 2,000 people, which took forever, and they were just filled with hope. They all have this, oh, look, we've got a degree, and we come back in 10 years, you'll be amazed at what has happened to that hope. But the long, I, I should have been the guest speaker. I don't think they would have enjoyed my message. <laughs> Congratulations, but your hopes are about to be dashed. The longer you live, the more things we have hoped in, and they they get taken away or they don't satisfy in the way that we hoped they would. And now your hope is dead. Your hope is dying a slow death. And Peter talks this morning about a living hope. We need one that doesn't die, one that doesn't disappoint, one that is alive and life-giving and it will not fade or perish or be destroyed. As I look around in this world, I call that midlife crisis. Midlife midlife crisis is when all of a sudden all the things I put my hope in in this life did not turn out to satisfy me. What else is there? So midlife crisis is a dying hope. And I'll tell you right now, midlife crisis is not just for unbelievers. Christians can put up all kinds of false hopes. If I live this way, God will do this for me. If I parent my kids in this way, my kids will grow up and be like this. If I give myself to Bible study and the word, I will grow this mature, I will have this much fruit, and when I don't see the progress that I had hoped for, I am now despairing. And so there are many, even in the Christian church sitting here this morning, who might be sitting here with disappointment and hopes that have been broken. And I've got good news for you, there's a living hope. Both unbelievers and even believers have misplaced hopes. And Peter is working to help us have a biblical living hope that will not die. And in verses six through nine, he says, God will bring trials to purify and change false hopes. He will stick you in the furnace to boil off your false hopes that are not in Jesus Christ. And what will come out is a purified faith that trust and hopes in God in the unchanging promise of a future glory that he has given to the saints that has been laid up for us. So everyone is looking for hope. You can't live without it. I was reading some interesting stuff uh, a while back on the Jewish concentration camps, and, and the ones who lost hope would die within days. And some of the ones who made it, you know, Corey Ten Boons and some of those types, it was because they, they had a hope beyond and their hope in Jesus Christ. Hope is crucial to how we live our lives. We are looking for fulfillment and purpose in the best things that life have to offer. There are those who are thinking, if I could just get a great marriage, that would be all that I need. If I could have the right family, if I could get my financial success, everything would be right. If I had popularity, life would be good. If I had sexual pleasure or drugs that will give me these things, those are the things that I'm building my hope around. Well, what, you, what do you do when it eludes you and it doesn't give you that promised pleasure and satisfaction? Some of you might have just grabbed it like Solomon and said, it's wind, it's a vapor. Your hope has been dashed. I've built my life upon this hope. What are you now? I'm hopeless. The very things that I hoped in and that I thought have been dashed and now I sit here hopeless. Well, this morning, I wanna draw your attention back to your living hope, and I'll tell you this morning, it cannot die. In fact, death only ushers it in and makes it more real. When you enter into this hope, when you've been there 10 million years, it will satisfy you more than the first day that it begun. And so guys, I, I pray this morning, and just scientists and sociologists have all concluded what you are hoping for determines your behavior now in the way that you think about your life. And so I'm going to bring an illustration that I've worn out. But you know when you get a good one that blesses you and you just keep overusing it? Well, there's some this morning who have never heard this. So if you've heard it, just kind of give me a little smile and kind of act like you're enjoying it. But I love this illustration. So I'm going to, I'm going to say I'm going to hire Kayla and I'm going to hire Abby. And so you both are hired. Uh, they have to work six days a week or let's say seven days a week, for 16 hours every day for one year. And at the end of the year, I'm going to pay Kayla $10,000. And at the end of the year, I'm going to pay Abby $100 
million. And so I just want you to think, what do you think their work will be like? Don't you think Kayla's going to start grumbling after a while? This isn't worth it. This is a bad job. This is kind of miserable. I, I don't enjoy this at all. And Abby's going to be going, <laughs> whistling why she works, going, this is the best job I've ever had in my life. And my point is so simple, is that what you hope in, what your reward is going to be, what everything is moving to, is going to affect how you live your life day to day. And Peter's now connecting that the only way you can persevere in trial, hardship, when the hopes of this world do not work, and they're squeezing in on you, is I've got a hope way better than $100 million. I've got a hope of spending eternity with the Lord Jesus Christ, sinless forever. And he's saying, if that that doesn't affect your day-to-day living. You do not understand biblical hope. This, we should be the most joyful people of all. No matter, in verses six through nine, no matter what trials there are, you can be weeping and still have hope and joy because of where your future is gonna end. I cannot bring you this morning, I, I can, I want to bring you this morning to our blessed hope. It's a certain hope, the Bible calls it. It's a living hope. Hope, the biblical hope isn't, I hope this happens. Biblical hope is certain. This is absolutely what God said. It will happen. It must happen. And so when I look at the three biggies that Paul talked about, he said there's faith, there's hope, and there's love. I think hope no longer gets its float at the church parade. I'm going to show you this morning lots of talk about faith and lots of talk about love, but I am seeing a decreasing talk among believers from pulpits, this idea of our blessed hope. And I'm going to show you this morning that for Peter, that is the only way you can endure the fiery furnace. That's the only way we'll come out as refined gold is if we have this blessed hope. If we don't, the things of this life will destroy us, take away our joy. We will become bitter. They will identify us. That is what will happen If we do not have a blessed hope, we'll come out as cinder without it. So shall we go to the throne of grace? That's my introduction. I was in a hurry. So any unbeliever who's come in here this morning and you have found yourself in a place of of no hope, that's how the Bible describes you, is you really have no hope and the things that you've hoped in are failing and that's probably why you've even come in here this morning. And so I pray that God would be merciful to shine into your hearts and give you the hope of the gospel of Jesus Christ. I want you to have a hope that will give life and transcend and, and, and help you for what you are looking for this morning. And so let, let's go before our God and ask him to do the specific work in each individual heart as we open up the word of God. Father, we come before you and I pray now that you will meet us in a special way. God, I I pray um, for those who are hopeless. Lord, I want them to feel a compassion. We just care so much about hopelessness. Lord, we we can't live without hope. And so I, I, I pray that if there's any in our midst who are hopeless, that this morning you would open their eyes to look upon the Lord Jesus Christ and find this hope, this hope that is a living hope this hope that gives them a future and a promise and an eternity, a hope that can bring them back to God in a safe, loving relationship. And so, God, would you do that in our midst for any who have no hope? And for every believer, God, we, we let our hope wane and drift. And I pray this morning that you would sharpen each and every hope of the believer here this morning. I pray this in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. So how do we get a living hope? I want one, don't you? In verses three through five, Peter's gonna give us five answers for how to get that. And he's gonna tell us the first one is God's great mercy. These are all in verse three. He says there's a new birth. It's through Christ's resurrection. In verse four, he says there's an inheritance that cannot fade or or go away. And verse five, you are kept for this inheritance by God, which will bring great hope to know that God is keeping you for this inheritance. <clears throat> Excuse me. So we saw the whole Trinity in verses one through two, and now we get to see the whole Bible in verses three through five. Peter does not back into anything. He doesn't like drawn out connections and long logical flows like Paul. He just gets down to business. I love it so. He doesn't give long introductions. He just jumps in, and I'm praying there's hope for me that I could stop doing this. <laughs> All righty, verse three. The first thing I want you to see to hope is God's great mercy. In verse 3, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his great 
mercy. Peter helps us see how that we are ever uh, born again. The way that we are born again to this living hope that we now have in Jesus Christ. And so the question is, how did it come to pass? How did I get born again? How did I enter in this living hope? To whom can I credit this morning for this amazing hope that I have? It's beyond belief. It's a, it's a blessed hope. So as we start to trace it, uh, where did it come from? We, we don't end up in this little place called our, our free will, that somehow our free will brought about this being born again into a living hope. We don't say the stars were aligned just right. I got lucky with a winning ticket. But as we trace it, we're going to end up in a very beautiful place. We're going to end up in the heart of God. And we're going to look right into his heart, and we find a God who's abounding in loving kindness. He's a God who shows mercy to generation after generation. So in the heart of God, there is mercy. I I, I praise the Lord that we have a sovereign God, and if he wasn't merciful, there would be no hope for us. But as we move and go into how did I get into this beautiful hope, It's because my God is a merciful God to to creatures who are sinful and cannot fix their condition. There's a mercy that we heard in these three testimonies from our God. He is merciful. Um, The God of the universe has mercy. I love Romans 11, 32. He's sharing how he worked in history with the Jews and the Gentiles God has shut up all in disobedience that he might show mercy to all. He, he, the whole reason for history, he's saying, is I want to show mercy to Jew and Gentile. Uh, Ephesians 2, God being rich in mercy. Here is his great mercy. There his rich mercy because of his great love with which he loved us. Even when we were dead in our transgressions, he made us alive together with Christ. That's being born again. We'll look at it in a second. By grace you've been saved. He raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. And so the reason I have this sure hope of spending eternity with the Godhead and all the saints who have been made perfect on a perfect restored earth that is for everlasting to everlasting is the sheer mercy of God. No one deserves to be born again. No one. It is by the mercy of God alone that any will be born again. No matter what your theological position is this morning on election or how it gets applied, would you join with Peter and land at the place of the free mercy of God that has caused me to be born again to a living hope. The beauty of a church filled with people who know that everything that you have is the mercy of God. It would change the whole atmosphere. Instead of being entitled little Americans, we'd be, I deserve nothing and I've received everything from God. It is sheer mercy. We are growing in this, but we can excel still more. What that would be with all of us just laid out saying it's all the mercy of God. What joins us together, there's no peacocks, just a bunch of broken people who give glory to God for everything. It is his mercy. And that is what has brought us in to our living hope this morning. Secondly, I want you to see, he says in verse 3, that it has caused us to be born again. This is what we call the new birth. This is what we call regeneration, palingenesis. This word, it's so, catch this, it's not so much talking about the birth canal as Nicodemus thought, but it's more the idea of of seed and origin. This is saying that, that God himself put his spirit within us, and hear this, now the life of God is in the soul of man. Christ in us, the hope of glory. A new birth. There is a new creation that makes a a stillborn now become alive spiritually because the seed of God, His Spirit, which is His Son uh, through His Spirit, now dwelling within us. The life of God can now grow and transform the children of God by the power of God. And what it can do is it can give us a living hope. I love with Jesus in John 3. He says, truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. And Nicodemus said, how can a man be born when he's old? He can't enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born, can he? You're missing it, Nicodemus. And Jesus said, truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. 
That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the Holy Spirit is spirit. So flesh begets flesh, and the spirit begets spirit. Dead corpses are made alive by the spirit of God. So the new birth is where that union happens, where the Bible says we are joined to Jesus Christ. And there's a good verse, uh, when you get time, go read Romans 6. And now all that Jesus is and all that he has done is imputed to your account. His life and his death now counts for you. And his indestructible life has begun in your soul. Again, the very presence of God takes up in the soul of man. We were born again. And today, what comes to mind when people hear the word born again Christian? What do you, what do you think? <laughs> First thing that comes to mind, I read a survey that said people would, in America would rather have as their neighbor a Mormon, a Jehovah's Witness, a Muslim, or even a sex offender than a born again Christian. So people say, oh, you're one of those born again types. No, I'm a Christian, but I'm not one of those. Uh, today, being born again is a type of Christian, and it, it usually means someone who's obnoxious, someone trying to convert you, not being accepting of any other views, waving John 3.16 signs, or someone said, oh, you're, you're like Tim Tebow. I wish. <coughs> so please hear this. This is not a category of Christian. This is how you know if you are a Christian. Peter says this is of everyone you were born again. This is anyone who is a Christian. The two terms are the same. You are born again unto this living hope through Jesus Christ. A born again Christian is repetitive. Being born again makes you a Christian, and being a Christian means you've been born again. And so the question for each heart this morning is, are you? I'm not asking you if you're religious. Uh, I'm asking what we just heard this morning in those testimonies. Have you been born again? I love to hear a man uh, twice the size of me stand up and say, I hated God, and now he gives glory that he loves him. That's born again. That doesn't happen by flesh. That can't happen naturally. Pastor, I don't even know what that means. How do I know if I'm born again? Well, let me try and deal with that one. Maybe I'll start with a question as I want someone to answer it out loud. How do you know if you were born physically? Give me some answers. I, I just did a funeral, and I and, uh, was at the funeral, and everybody was talking during it. They were, amen, yes, preacher, and they're saying all these great things, so it kind of got me excited. So how, how do you know if you were born physically? Who said that? Way to be bold. I'm here. That's a beautiful answer. I'm, that's, I love that answer. Why didn't she say, because I have a birth certificate? I drove back to Kenmore Mercy Hospital in New York City, and they have a birth certificate that says Ken Murphy was born there. I have affidavits of people who saw my mom nine months pregnant walking into a hospital and coming out with a little baby and a less of a bump. It's just such an easy question. The answer is I'm alive. I had to have been born. End of argument. There's only a few people who would argue with that, and they'll argue with anybody, and some of you are married to that person, unfortunately. <laughs> I'm alive. So the question is, how do I know if I've been born again? How do I know if I've been born again? I'm alive. I am alive spiritually. Romans 6 says, I was dead to sin. I was dead, and I've been made alive to God in Christ Jesus. The way I know if I've been born again is I'm alive. I'm alive spiritually, and I'm alive to the Lord Jesus Christ. I remember when I was lost, and Christianity didn't do much for me. And maybe I grew up in the church, as we heard this morning, and it was boring, and my parents made me come. I hated it. I wanted to ridicule anyone who believed, and I used to torment them. But God, something started working in my life and my heart outside of me. That was every testimony. It was outside of me. Something started acting on me, and something began changing. That message uh, that was stupid or old or boring that God sent his son and crucified him and he died and he buried and he rose again now to save sinners started becoming interesting. It started becoming real and then the power of God could save even me. 
Something happened and I saw the beauty of God in the face of Jesus Christ. I was taken up by the beauty of Christ in that story and I just see too many people who just know some facts and have never been born again. And so th this, I've been born again. I've been made alive. How do I know I've been born again? I'm alive. I'm alive to God. The seed of God was planted in my soul. There's been a new birth, and I am a believing one, and I'm a repenting one. Jesus is beautiful, and I, in verse 8 and 9, I love him. With the eyes of your heart, Paul says, you can see him. You see what Peter is saying? This kind of knowing will keep you from wavering. When terrorists put a gun in your face or the doctor calls and says terminal cancer, if this is just external religion, not born again to a living hope, it's not worth dying for and you will renounce Jesus Christ. It is not worth living for either then. And so brothers and sisters, we have been born again by the mercy of God to a living hope. And I want to try to clear up one thing, which I'm out of time a long time ago, so I don't know what to do. Uh, I've just, I, once I start, I can't stop. So, not to confuse or stumble anyone, but the new birth is an instant act. It happens in an instant. You were dead, he makes you alive, and what's that movie, you can't be mostly dead. You are, you're dead, and he brings you, and he makes you alive spiritually. But there are a variety of ways to how to know how the new birth can happen. How God draws you. I, I heard three examples this week, and I wanted to repeat them, and they were close to all of our testimonies even this morning. D. Martin Lloyd-Jones, the doctor, famous preacher at the Westminster Chapel, uh, he, he tells the story of a man one Sunday night. He was so depressed and suicidal, he was walking to a bridge to throw himself off of it. And as he walked near, that it was a uh, summer, and the windows were open, and he, and he heard the music, and it, it, it hit him, and he went in. And he heard the word of God preached that night, and by the end, he repented and called upon the Lord Jesus Christ and was saved. Pretty dramatic, huh? I'm going to kill myself, and by the end of the night, I've been born again to a living hope. The other example was C. Everett Koop, Surgeon General of the United States, a brilliant children's doctor. I think he might have separated the first Siamese twins, I can't remember now. But his wife dragged him to church every Sunday in Philadelphia to where Donald Gray Barnhouse was the pastor. And he would listen, and he said, I didn't like anything that I heard. He felt uh, as if it was all stupid and, on and only for people who weren't intellectual. And a year and a half later, he believed everything the pastor was saying, and he said it was very slowly, it was one argument from another, building on one to another. And he said, at some point, I came to believe it. And what day or month he was born again, he said, I, I couldn't tell you. So at some point, it was instantaneous, but in his experience, he just remembers slowly believing, hearing, and eventually uh, knows that he had been saved. Ruth Bell Graham, the wife of Billy Graham, she was a little child raised in the church. <clears throat> she heard the gospel again and again. She said, at age three, I remember certain truths, and five, and eight, and what she understood, she said, I embraced. And at the age of 14, she said, there was really never an age that I can remember when I didn't believe. So everyone has to be born again. I want to make sure you catch that. But she, she didn't know when she was saved. But the fruit of her life is this amazing fruit of one being born again and how God used her. So I want you to catch this. The new birth can be perceived as dramatic or very subtle. But let me share with you what is going on at the new birth and we'll close. Uh, I preached in Titus, and I went over this a little bit, but I want to refresh your memories. The Greek word for rebirth, it was used in Titus 3, 5. He saved us not on the basis of deeds which we have done in righteousness, but according to his mercy. Sound familiar? By his mercy, by the washing of regeneration and renewing by the Holy Spirit. By his mercy, he caused you to be regenerated, to be born again. And it's the same word used in Matthew 19, 28. Jesus was preaching, and he said, truly I say to you, that you who have followed me in the, here's the Greek word, in the regeneration, when the Son of Man will sit on his glorious throne, you shall sit upon 12 thrones judging the 12 tribes of Israel. There's this day when everything is going to be made right. God's power at the end of time where every stain, everything broken about this world is going to be undone. Everything sad is going to be gone away. There's going to be the renewal of all things, this 
great regeneration of everything is our hope. That's where everything's moving. But I want you to see the power of God to regenerate this whole earth. And Peter and Paul and John have the nerve to use the exact same word of that day and say that power comes into your life and brings faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. That is the power that we now have to change. And I think we're settling for things we don't have to in our lives. The new birth is in you, and there's a possibility for change that is unbelievable and amazing. I love, what I love about the ministry is never getting tired of watching that change. Uh, Augustine in the fourth century, uh, he, he lived a wild and licentious life, and he was saved radically with a new birth. And, and one day he was walking down the street, and an old mistress saw him and came and threw herself at him. And he didn't respond. He just kept walking. And the lady said, Augustine, it's me. And he said, yes, but it's not me. He said, I've been born again, and those things don't define me anymore. I've been regenerated. I'm a new creation. It is not me any longer. And so my, we, we have been born again. And, and we, we see this. I want you to catch this. We see it in our hopes. We have been born again into a living hope. We, we have this hope of life with God and eternity and consummation and where he's moving everything. So we've been made, we were dead and we're made alive and now we have this living hope. The Christian cannot be hopeless. We, the, the very salvation as I've been made alive to this living hope. I don't know how we've lost that in the body of Christ. And he says that it happens, and I got to leave, through the resurrection. There's going to be a little couple standing. So if you're upset saying, I love the word, keep preaching, picture this little couple just standing there going, where's our pastor? And the, and the whole crowd <laughs> sitting there. So next week, we're going to take up through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. My hope is, is a certain that Jesus Christ is seated right now at, God, at the right hand of the Father. And so my hope cannot be taken away. He is risen. He's risen indeed. So, my application, verse 3, is blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. We should worship. We, the, the application is this isn't just doctrine. We should worship the living God that I was dead, and his mercy made me alive, and I have a living hope that it can't be taken away. It can't be stolen from me.